Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 11th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, Frank Murkowski makes us think about whether the Alaska governor candidates are talking about the right issues. Second, the 3% carve-out from ANWR revenues proposed by the Alaska Congressional Delegation. And third, in a federal fiscal moment, why Social Security and Medicare are becoming issues. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, he comes on every week to talk with us about, well, budgets, uh, both national and statewide, and much, much more. Uh, he joins us this morning uh, to discuss some interesting stuff. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. How was Homer? Man, as you could, well, I don't know if you were watching the video earlier, you could see I got a little bit of color. I'm usually not sun sensitive, but I got enough sun this weekend to actually give myself a little bit of a pinkness. So it was, uh, it was hot. It was beautiful. It was uh, God's country. That's all I could say down there in beautiful Homer. It was amazing down there. I've got to, I've got to say, I really enjoy the posts you make when you're, uh, when you're out and about like that. It's a sort of a mini finer things that you do. And, and, uh, and I enjoy following along. Well, I appreciate it. It was a finer things for sure. We had, uh, you know, that Bear Creek Music Festival was an amazing amalgam. I think you would have gotten a kick out of it. We uh, we started off with Cousin Curtis, and then we had the Searson. Um, well, this is a band called Searson. It's made up of the Searson sisters and a bassist and a and a and a, uh, a, a drummer. And they're a Canadian kind of Celtic fiddle uh, combo. They they did an amazing job. It was an amazing time. And then the Sh the Shane Dwight band. It was so much music. It was like five and a half hours of music out in the sunshine with a fresh 220 pound pig, some shrimp, and lots of wine and beer. It was an amazing concert. Um, but that was just one day of the uh, four or five days we were down there. It was just it was just an amazing time. I can't I can't recommend enough that folks who haven't made it down to Homer get on down there and enjoy themselves. Uh, get them uh, this year. So. Um, yeah, that that's the thing. About, that's the thing about Alaska in the summer, right? I mean, that this is the time to get out and enjoy this stuff. There's yeah. stuff up in in Talkeetna. There's stuff up in Denali. Stuff in Fairbanks. Stuff down in, on the Kenai. Down in Homer. It's just it's in a great it's a great time for people to get out. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, and and now of course with all the daylight and everything, you forget what time. I found myself sitting out on the front porch of the uh, Ocean Shores Hotel. Uh, which I, I shot a video of the night we showed up. I mean, we showed up about seven o'clock, six or seven o'clock on, um, I guess it was Thursday night. And I just shot a video because it was just so amazing right out the front door. But there were a couple nights where I found myself out on the front porch of my hotel room, which is basically right there on the ocean. It's right there on the, there's a, a stretch of lawn and then you're right at the ocean. Um, I found myself just sitting there until I got cold. I was like, why am I cold? And then I realized I've been sitting here for two and a half hours and it was 1130 at night. Sun's still up. You know, the mountains are still pink. It's just it's breathtaking. And I just been sitting there drinking it in, listening to quiet music, watching the whole thing. It was an amazing time. I will just say that it was an amazing time. So but we have to come back to reality eventually. Uh, we were just talking about that with Don Young, 85 years old, still still says he's going to go back. 
Uh, eventually, we all have to uh, we all have to take a break and come back to, to reality. Um, what are, what what's on your mind today here? What do we want to start off with with your top three for Brad Keithley and Alaskans for sustainable budgets? Well, well, my my first one um, is an article, maybe maybe one of the last. Well, will be one of the last, if not the last, that that hurts rights for uh, the Anchorage Daily News. Uh, the headline was Frank Murkowski seriously considered running for Alaska governor again, and <laughs> uh, and and there were rumors about that in the in the final days in the run up to uh, to uh, the filing date. Jeff Landfield had some of that in the Alaska landmine, uh, and I heard about it a couple of other places, and I and I really discounted it. But Nat followed up on it uh, in a conversation with both Frank. Uh, and his wife about uh, about whether it was true, and and evidently it was, and and has an interesting story about why he was considering it, why he ultimately didn't, and and one interesting tidbit about uh, the advice Lisa, <laughs> the advice Lisa gave him, um, or the comments Lisa made about uh, about potentially running. So that that's sort of that's sort of our starting point. Well, let's kick that off. Um, I mean, Frank Murkowski, obviously. You know, kind of a, the, a lion in the center for a long time, uh, you know, gave up his seat to come back and uh, run for governor, which ensconced his daughter in that seat immediately thereafter. Uh, kind of this dynastic thing, which just rankles me the wrong way, quite honestly. That whole thing, that whole thing to me was just one of those things where it, it just smacked of dynasty. And uh, I was never happy with it. Um I was never uh, completely happy with Murkowski's reign as governor at the same time. Uh, and the fact that he thought that he would have to swing in here and just save the day to take us back to wherever. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm a little, um, I find it a little arrogant again. I was talking about Don Young's arrogance. Maybe I find that a little arrogant again. What, what are your thoughts on it? Well, the, the, the reason at, 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 according to the story, the reason that Murkowski was thinking that, uh, that that he should run or needed to run or was 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 going through the thought process was because he was concerned. According to the article, he was concerned that that we that the the candidates currently running weren't talking about the right issues. Um, and and I found that you know I find that a little intriguing and and it made me go back and think about whether we do have the right issues, whether we are talking about the right issues this uh, this campaign. Murkowski's point was that we weren't talking enough about resource development. If you if you followed uh, Frank's career in the Senate as I, as as you and and I'm and I'm certain many of the listeners did, uh, and as I did even even from afar, uh, Frank was Frank was always talking about resource development. That was right. his big that was his big issue. He certainly got involved in others, yeah. but when he was chair, in his, during his term as chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, and then as ranking member, he, he really focused on, on resource development issues. And his point, uh, in the, in the discussion with Nat, his point was that, that we aren't, that we weren't talking enough about natural resource development in Alaska, that there wasn't enough, uh, being voiced in the, in the, in the, in the governor's race about that. Now he says that he finally decided at the end not to run, uh, because me Treadwell was running. Um, and and he thought that that would inject enough discussion about resources into the issue. I I, I sort of I'm a little skeptical of that because Meade filed <laughs> right at the very end, uh, and unless Frank was sitting there at some right. at some uh, uh, office ready to go, if Meade didn't file, I, I'm I'm not quite sure if, if Frank hadn't made up his mind before that, or maybe he'd talk to Meade. But but um, it, it's intriguing that he that he thinks we're not talking about enough about resource development. I, I don't I. We're, it, it's true. This is this part's true. Resource development is not at the center stage uh, of this gubernatorial campaign. Right. Unlike uh, 2014, when we had SB 21, when the when the legislature had passed SB 21, the revision to oil taxes, and we'd gone through and, and we went through in the primary uh, the the uh, 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 ref referendum on whether to retain SB 21. Uh, in 2014, we had we had a lot of discussion about natural resource development and and the role the state plays, certainly in tax policy, in uh, in how that plays out. And we're not doing that this time. It's not there's not a huge 
at least thus far in the campaign. There's not a huge discussion uh, going on about uh, about resource development. So to that extent, Frank's correct. But I guess the question that that, that then raised for me is, do we need to be talking about resource uh, development? Is Should that be at the center of, of this election campaign? Um, and as I thought about it, I, I think the answer to that is no. It, it, it should be an issue. Right. Um, and it should be one that the candidates are asked to discuss. Um, and it should be one that they're prepared to discuss and that they talk about. But I don't I don't think this time that resource development is at the center um, of 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 what the state you know, should be talking about or what the state should be doing. Frankly, I think that's because we're doing pretty good in resource development. Right. Now, setting Pebble aside, which is an issue that that we can talk about separately, but setting Pebble aside, if you look at the slope, uh, we are having a, a, a substantial amount of activity going on up there. Um, you know, starting on the eastern side of this or on the western side of the slope, you've got all sorts of, of activity by Conoco. Uh, the new exploration plays, new development plays. They're talking about putting a production center now out in the Willow area, which is a mate would be a major step uh, and an indication that there's a lot more out there, uh, uh, a lot more to, that they think a lot more development is to come out in that area, out in the NPRA area. Uh, that's 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 pretty good stuff. You, you sort of step in toward the the center of the slope, and uh, and you've got the Armstrong uh, Repsol now oil search play uh, that is that is starting to, to go through the development process. Um, that's a that's a big deal, and that's and that's a pretty strong uh, development. And then you go to the east, and you've got Anwar uh, that Congress and and with the president signing have open Anwar for leasing. Uh, uh, the Interior Department is out there taking comment on what the best way is to develop uh, the leasing, to go through the leasing prospect. They're, the Interior is starting to spend some money uh, to to begin to get uh, uh, the, the 1002 area in shape for leasing. So we've got, on the slope, we've got a lot of activity going on uh, in terms of oil. And then you've got, in, and then when you talk about gas, we've got LNG going on. Now that's an issue about how deeply the state ought to be involved and there, and there, there are things to discuss in that, but we've got activity going on. It, it, it's not like 2014 and it's not like some of the situations that, that Murkowski faced when he was Senator, uh, and governor where you really had a very low level of activity, no exploration going on, no, no development going on. It's we're, we're not facing that sort of situation. So, so I, I, I appreciate uh, the comments that Murkowski made about whether we we're, we're really talking about the right issues in the gu- gubernatorial campaign. I think it's a good thing to think about and a good thing to discuss, but, but frankly, I'm glad he didn't run. I, I, I don't think he would have, I, I, <laughs> I don't think he would have won. I think it would have been confusing, and and I think it would have been um, maybe we would have talked about things in the past more than 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 things in the future. And this is an election where we need to be talking about things in the future. Yeah, and I mean, I could see his point in saying that he wanted to do he wanted to be more offensive, right? I mean, he wanted to go on the offense with the plan uh, that he saw it as a time where they could strike while the iron was hot, per se. With Trump in office, you know, with control of the House and the Senate, and hopefully holding back on a lot of the environmental, you know, brouhaha that seems to come from that, uh, and that I, I think his impetus was that by focusing more on uh, uh, resources, that we could overwhelm this problem with money. But I think that that still doesn't address the problem. Uh, I think that's the fatal flaw in that argument is that it still doesn't address the problem. The answer was always, I think, in his mind, more development. More oil, more resources means more money, and it'll overwhelm this problem that we have. But the bottom line is, is that we don't have a money problem; we've got a spending problem, and uh, and I think that's the baseline here. That he, I mean, was part of the problem of his campaign, quite honestly, and his uh, his administration, and continues to kind of be part of the mindset that he continues to bring to this discussion. Yeah, it's. I, I think I think that's right. I think I think you know those who focus on resource development and say it's going to solve uh, the state's problem. It, it is part of the solution, but, but you have to remember that, that in SB 21, 
uh, we adopted an oil tax regime, uh, and I think for good reason, that, that, that frankly doesn't get the state a lot of production tax money, gets royalty money, but doesn't get the state a lot of production tax money in the early years of a development. Um, SB 21 sort of had that open-ended. It was the last legislature, uh, I think the year before last in the last session, uh, sort of constrained that to a degree, made amendments to SB 21 to limit the amount of time that that sort of the, the production tax holiday for new development applies. Uh, but, but that's, you've got, we've got things like that built into the system and, and current oil prices being what they are, we're not going to climb out of this hole, this fiscal hole that we're in uh, uh, through through new development. That's going to be part of the solution, um, and certainly, certainly, we need to make certain that that resource development stays on track. That the that the the steps that have been taken on the slope uh, stay on track. But that's not the entire solution. We're not going to we're not going to be able to pay for the current level of spending we have. Uh, just out of resource development, oil has to go back to one hundred and thirty dollars hundred and forty dollars it has to it has to do big things right make big movements that no one expects it make expects it to make uh in order to in order for us to 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 revenue our way out of this problem um and frank during frank 's administration certainly it, we were facing one of our fiscal crises uh during that period, and certainly he was he took some significant steps toward cost control. Uh, that's when, during his administration, is when uh, PERS and TERS and state retirement were taken off a, a defined benefit plan and moved to a defined contribution plan, which, you know, I mean, we've got PERS and TERS problems that are going to continue for decades, but but at least they aren't as big as they could have been had, had we continued with a defined benefit plan. So, I mean, Frank took steps during his administration, but if, but it, but if he wanted to inject into this, if, if the way if, if if what he wanted to do was to redirect discussion in this race around resource development, I think that's taking us away from the issues that we need to be talking about, the fiscal issues we need to be talking about, um, and sort of sending us off into a into a misdirect uh, uh, down a road that uh, that most people agree about that we that we seem to be on track to do, but that doesn't address. Uh, the core issue that we're facing right now. Well, and doesn't this, in a way, kind of address the tone deafness that we see in the halls of power in this state? That they, I mean, this is kind of just a microcosm of that because it shows that they think this is the discussion they should be having. Why are we so focused on something else, silly peasants? Why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't we be focused on the important stuff here? Um, I mean, to me, again, that. This, it, I keep using the word, and I don't mean it disrespectfully, but it's the perception of arrogance. It is the perception of that we know better than you, that you know we're the only ones that can get this done, even though we're we're octogenarians, that we we're the ones that should be able to do this. Nobody else could do the job. Kind of attitude that we're seeing from you know from both Burkowski and Don Young in this regard. Um, uh, to me, it just it it looks like again, kind of that disconnectedness from the Alaska electorate. Well, it's certainly the case at 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 the governor's level. I mean, I, it's Frank thinking that we need to that he needs to inject himself in the race to talk about something that we're not talking about. Um, I think is um, I don't know if I'd use the word arrogant, but it's a it's a it's. It, it, it it's not responding to the to the situation we're facing today. Don Young to me is a different situation. We're we're going to talk about that sort of in a little bit. Don Young's a different situation. He's facing congressional issues, and what and what Alaska can accomplish um, in Congress. And in you know Congress is built on seniority, and and Young has some influence. We'll 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 see it play out in the next issue we talk about. Um, and. And so that that to me is a little bit different. But Frank saying, I mean, I I've, I guess I focus on the issues these guys are raising. Frank saying that uh, I've got to come back in the race because we're not talking about the right things. Uh, just I, that that is tone deafness. That is that is I think you know trying to sort of come back from from having been there and and trying to reinject yourself again. Um, and and lead us into a direction that the state Frank frankly doesn't need to be doesn't need to be reminded of because we're doing resource development. We need to be talking about something else in this race. 
one of the things that I noticed in the article, which I thought was kind of funny, was that he got a little cagey there. Um, he said that one of the reasons why he decided to pull out, as you mentioned earlier, was the late entry of Treadwell. But uh, he, according to Nat Hers, he was careful not to endorse or name Treadwell, saying he didn't want to pick sides for the outcome of a primary election. Yet he got real cagey with his language later on, saying, "I mean, I don't even know. It's just yeah, why? What? What's with the caginess? What are? You, what is your thought on that?" Well, we've we've got a little bit of a ABD, anybody but Dunleavy, uh, going on here. I mean, the fact that Dunleavy had announced so long ago and been running for so long and and was seen to be the front runner for Frank even to consider running is sort of a is sort of a uh, 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 a comment on his on his uh, reaction to Dunleavy running so strong in the primary. And then, you know, we've got, he said, well, I didn't need to do it if Treadwell's going to step up and do it. Uh, well, okay, so Dunleavy's been running this, this entire time. That's right. sort of a commentary, again, on, on, what, on, on his reaction to Dunleavy. I mean, Dunleavy certainly, I mean, so, so we've got sort of this split going on in the Alaska Republican Party between the establishment, the the business wing, the chamber of commerce wing, as I sometimes call it, uh, the Republican Party that that is is not entirely trusting of, of where Dunleavy is going. I mean, the, I, I don't think they they entirely grasp uh, uh, the the genesis of the Dunleavy ca- campaign, why Dunleavy is so strong, uh, and and they're trying to come up, you know, with an alternative. Um, and so I, it, yeah, it, it's I, I, Frank. I just took Frank as his. His comments is, I don't want to say that I'm in the ABD camp, the anybody but Dunleavy <laughs> camp, but but that's sort of where I am right now. That's pretty much where it all ends up. Well, uh, I'm glad he didn't jump into the race. He apparently said, Lisa said, uh, that you know, she was pretty blunt about why do it again? You did it once. Why do it again? Uh, I don't think she wants anybody undershadowing or trying to undercut her legacy uh, in this regard. Um, but it'll be, you know, it'll be interesting to see, uh, what happens. I'm glad he's not in the race, although it would have made for interesting fodder. That's for sure. Um, yeah, it would, it would have confused things. Yeah. I, I mean, it, 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 he, he wouldn't have won. It would have got, it, but it would have taken out a segment of the vote and it would have gone that direction. It just would have, it would have confused things up. I think, I think we've got a, I think we've got a fairly clear race now between Dunleavy and Treadwell, who I assume is is the lead challenger to Dunleavy now. If you look at the at the poll that came out yesterday that was in Must Read Alaska that has Dunleavy far ahead but Treadwell second and then Hawkins third. Um I think we've got a much clearer race when it's a one on one basically a one on one between Dunleavy and Treadwell than than if you inject a former governor into it and see what the hell happens then. Yeah, no, I will say that in my this is my unofficial unscientific poll of driving the peninsula from uh, Wasilla down to Homer. Uh, I saw a lot more Dunleavy signs than anything else. There were uh, probably two to one Dunleavy to Hawkins signs, uh, except right in the heart of was of uh, Soldatna Kenai. Uh, there was a, there was a little bit more of a density of Hawkins signs, but all the way down to Homer. Uh, and then I saw it was in Homer that I saw a few Walker Malat signs. Uh, which I guess is not surprising for the little cosmic hamlet by the sea there. But uh, anyway, it was uh, my unform- my uninformal or my, I guess my informal poll was uh, it was mostly Dunleavy all the way down. I think he's got a pretty good shot of tying this up, and, and I hope so when it's all said and done. Yeah, it, the, the Kenai is interesting. I mean, the, the Kenai, uh, I was down in the Kenai and, and had a chance last week and had a chance to talk to some people and and fish. Um, fish is a big issue throughout Alaska, but fish on the Kenai uh, is a big issue. And the fact that Bob Penny, uh, the sports fisher, the sports fishery side, is such a strong supporter of Dunleavy. Penny is one of the big contributors to the to the independent pack that's supporting Dunleavy's campaign. The fact that 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 Penny's playing such a big role in that uh, really has sort of raised uh, fish as an issue. Uh, on the Kenai, whether Dunleavy is already in the camp of the sports fisher, sports fishing, sports fishing side, which creates the whole, you know, the distrust from the commercial fishing side. So, um, Kenai, the, 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 the issues that you and I talk about on here, the, the fiscal issues and the oil and gas issues, um, I was surprised how strong 
how it, they were perceived as important, but how important Fitch was on the Kenai and right. uh, and the perception that that uh, Dunleavy may not be on the right side of that. Well, we'll be watching it for sure. But again, uh, I was heartened to see that there was a lot of Dunleavy signs on the way down, for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about a larger national issue. Uh, well, an issue from a national level that has large ramifications for the state of Alaska. Uh, and that's this latest article from Craig Medred talking about our loss of the 50-50 split uh, on Anwar. Let's uh, let's discuss that. Okay, so... So Medrid has an article, and um, and uh, 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 the Alaska Public Radio website has an article as well. has a piece up on a bill that uh, has been it was offered in in House Appropriations by Tom Cole, but uh, a, a Republican from Oklahoma. But as Cole said uh, in the APRN article, uh, done at the at the request direct request of Don Young, um, and that bill takes uh anwar was resolved uh in a way where 50 percent of the revenues uh, would go to the federal government 50 percent of the revenues from from leasing in anwar would go to the federal government and 50 percent of the revenues would go to the state that's uh, a difference from the 90 10 that was that was talked about at the time of statehood but uh 50 50 if that's what it took to get the bill 50 percent of something is better than 90 percent of nothing so i've 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 accepted 50-50 uh, as, as this debate has worn on. But then the coal bill takes the 50% that goes to the state, splits off 3% of that, essentially 6% of the state's share, 3% of 50% is 6% of what the state gets, takes, uh, <clears throat> takes uh, 6% of the state's share and will distribute that to the native corps uh, through the seven I uh, mechanism in the that, that's contained in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Indian Claim Settlement Act, seven I provides that uh, resource uh, or revenues received by any of the native corps will be shared amongst all of them. Seventy uh, percent uh, of that of that revenue stream will be shared amongst all of them. Thirty percent remaining with the native corp that uh, on whose lands uh, the development occurs. So the coal amendment will take six percent of Alaska's share of the revenues coming from Anwar. Would take six percent of the of the Alaska share uh, of the uh, revenues coming from Anwar and distribute that out to the native corps in accordance with seven I. I assume. Uh, well, I don't know. Seventy uh, percent uh, for sure will go will be distributed among all the native corps. I don't know if that means thirty percent will be retained by ASRC or whether that thirty percent is also going to be subject to seven I because ASRC has a separate share. But but in any event, takes that six percent of Alaska's share and distributes it to, distributes it out to the native corps. This what's interesting about this is that they say that it came from Don Young initially. Um, although in my initial reading of this, when I first saw the headlines and I saw I kind of skimmed the first couple paragraphs, I thought, oh, here we go, Oklahoma again, because there's been some contention between some of the other uh, some of the other oil states, some of the other coal states about some of the statuses that Alaska's had, and I thought it was going to be more of a chipping away uh, at some of those things. But then you get down into the article and you find out that nobody who was really in the Alaska delegation, the governor's office, nobody really wanted to talk about this. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering why there's kind of this obfuscation of who was really the jet. I mean, they keep saying it was Don Young, but it doesn't look like that there was a quote from anywhere in here from anybody uh, that actually was in a position of authority on that. So what's your take on this? Well, frankly, Michael, I think, I think this is to some degree a preemptive strike um, by the delegation to try to uh, 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 knock down roadblocks that otherwise might might hinder Anwar or otherwise might delay Anwar. There's a, there's been a whole series of of events over time uh, related to Anwar, sort of bubbling underneath the surface. Um, one of them was an agreement along the way that essentially transferred. A portion of the federal lands to ASRC, um, and and 
the the, the North Slope uh, Regional Corporation, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, um, transferred uh, lands to ASRC and excluded or, or subsurface lands that are that are in the Anwar area and excluded those lands from the 7i provision. So essentially, gave ASRC a hundred percent of the revenues from uh, from those lands to uh, uh, from that lease uh, leasehold acreage to uh, to ASRC. Now that that then generated has generated a reaction from the other native corps who say, look, you know, Seven I was created <laughs> in order to share these revenues, and now you've given ASRC an exclusive. And I think the concern has been or was that 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 sort of 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 break between the native corps could lead to opposition or could lead to uh, issues developing that would slow down the development of Anwar and and would would result in uh, in people trying yeah. to you know in fighting very good right. in fighting to, yeah. to that would uh, that would have have an, have that effect so this to me is is as much uh, an effort to try to clear away um uh, anything that's, that's going to get in the way of 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 unified support for the development of anwar um uh, uh, as 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 anything else now whether you know uh, there hasn't been a lot of transparency on this uh craig medrid's piece uh is a great piece for talking about the it does a great job talking about the lack of transparency, and you know, all of a sudden this pops up in an amendment from a guy from a guy from Oklahoma. What's going on here? Um, and 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 I think I think we need a lot of transparency. I think we need need to have this discussion. Uh, some some people will say, well, why three percent or six percent of Alaska share? Where, where did that number come from? Uh, and I'm sure there's a foundation for the number, but but cutting sort of through all that and cutting to the chase. I think steps that that can be taken to uh, uh, make sure the Anwar process, the Anwar development process, goes as smoothly as it can, uh, and and unifies the support behind Anwar development uh, is is a good thing. As I as I said, 50% of of something is better than 90% of nothing. 47% uh, of something that comes sooner uh, and comes easier and comes with less restrictions than 50% of something that's burdened down and gets delayed and comes later. 47% of that something is better than 50% of that, of that delayed something. So I think the calculus is, is, is good um, if that's what it achieves, but we do need to have a discussion about this. I think Alaskans do need to understand why 3% of the share that otherwise would go to the state is now being diverted off to the native corporations. Well, and I mean, I, and I think we, we jumped, Right over it, although you mentioned it, I think you did jump right over it, the broken promise of the 90-10 split, which we, you know, we've been, I mean, we've been the bastard redheaded stepchildren of the United States since statehood. I mean, since, this, again, the sacrifice of our subsurface mineral rights on downward, that 90-10 split was a promise that we were initially, you know, was initially fought for and 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 put forward. And now to come back and say, oh, no, we've got to be satisfied with the 50-50. I always, that always rankled me as well. Um, uh, but there's a lot of powers that be that are, that are, uh, you know, swinging the big hammers on these things. But to me, that was just another example of Alaska kind of getting the sticky end of the lollipop on this deal, uh, when they were offered, you know, offered the moon and instead handed a bowl full of rice kind of thing. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta sort of appreciate how Murkowski got this through Congress though, right? She got it through in a budget reconciliation and the way and 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 the reason she used budget reconciliation is because that's not subject to the filibuster rules. Right. It's an exception to the filibuster rules. Um, and so she didn't need. She would never have gotten sixty votes. Uh, she needed fifty-one. And and using using budget reconciliation, she got fifty-one. Well, if you're going to use budget reconciliation, you've got to you've got to show that you're that 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 the piece of legislation that's inside the budget reconciliation. Is helping to resolve uh, the budget. The budget. Right. It, it's helping to produce revenue. Um, it's either cutting costs or producing revenue. So you got to show it's helping to produce revenue. And and frankly, ninety ten, uh, the ten percent wasn't going to produce much revenue. And 
and probably wouldn't have flown as a as a piece of budget reconciliation. So, um, you know, we, we we can always all of us can always second guess anybody and say, well, why was it <clears throat> right. why is it fifty fifty instead of seventy five twenty five? Right. Um, and again, on this, why is it six instead of you know instead of five or instead of four? Um, it, it, a lot of that's a judgment call you have to make on the ground. But I, I've I, I've I I understand why we've done fifty fifty. I understand why uh, that's a that's a piece of the of the equation. Uh, and as I said, fifty fifty of something is better than than ninety of nothing. Uh, any final thoughts here on? I mean, Tom Cole was he a, is he a member of the? Uh, I guess you'll have to educate me on this. Is he he's part of appropriation? So is that why he carried the bill for Young? Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Cole okay. is Cole is a member of House leadership, is a member of appropriations. Uh and you know, going back to Don Young being eighty five and why is he running again, this is this is stuff Don Young can pull off, right? I mean, Tom Cole Tom Cole's been in Congress for a long time, but Don Young is just, you know, way longer than any of them and he's developed these relationships um uh, with members and is something that Young can pull off with Cole. Now people may say did, did, is it the right thing to have pulled off i i i'm being persuaded it is um uh and it's one of these things that young can do you know young's not on appropriations but but can do it with cole so and and cole i mean cole's the right person to do it cole's a whip i think yeah uh maybe he's an assistant whip um uh but tom's pretty pretty connected pretty powerful uh, and, uh, and, and he's the right person to, to carry this in, inside, uh, Tom's also, uh, Native American. Um, okay. and, and, and so Tom's sort of the right person to carry this bill. Long-term impact on Alaska. Obviously we will see more money, but we have to acknowledge that it's not going to be the full 50%. And as you said, this may short circuit any kind of infighting amongst the corporations that they may if they're going to throw hindrances or roadblocks to further Anwar development, this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of carrot that they were looking for to prevent the, uh, to prevent that infighting that may have slowed it all down. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, uh, I, I mean, we need to have a discussion around it. Young and Murkowski and, and Senator Sullivan need to need to address it and, and why it was appropriate and why the, why the, the 6% of Alaska's share is the appropriate number to come up with. Uh, but, but my understanding from the from the discussions I had after I saw uh, Craig Medrud's piece uh, is that it's really to try to continue to get everybody in alignment to get this thing and, and to get it done quickly. I mean, there's you know there's concerns that 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 the Republicans are going to lose the House this election cycle. Uh, there's concerns that always concerns that you lose the uh, uh, lose the presidency after after four years. Uh, there's there's a real effort to get this ver as far down the road as you possibly can uh, inside uh, the current administration and inside the current Congress, uh, if at all possible. And so these sorts of steps that 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 you can take that need to be taken at the federal level to resolve uh, issues that may become impediments down the road. It's the right thing to be doing. It's the right thing to be thinking about. We need to have a discussion about why this particular step was appropriate, but but if it was, as I as I have come to understand, if it was to resolve uh, concerns about these issues, it was the right step to take. Uh, William asked a question in the chat room that I'm actually not sure of. He says, "Aren't Alaskans supposed to vote on this? I mean, the Statehood Compact said that if you change, that it should get a vote of the Alaskans to let them decide." Um, that sounds vaguely familiar, but I'm not 100 percent sure on it. Are you familiar with that, Brent? No, I think this is something that that Congress has the uh, has the okay. power to change. I don't think it require. Well, I'm I'm confident it doesn't require a vote of the citizens. There may have been rhetoric about that at the time and along the way, uh, but uh, but this is something that's uh, uh, the, the the dealings with federal lands is something that Congress has retained the power to do. Well, we'll be watching this to see where it goes and uh, and and see what uh, see see how it how it plays out. And like you said, maybe it will uh, stop some of that uh, potential slowdown of, uh, of Anwar, which, of course, is one of the things that we're looking forward to as far as whether or not uh, we'll have more revenues coming into the state of Alaska moving forward. Um, final, final, final big story of the day. Uh, your number three on your top three for the week 
is the is on a federal level. I mean, talking about, you know, we often talk about kicking the can down the road here in the state of Alaska, but um, that this is, again, a learned behavior, in my opinion, and something we're seeing at the national level all the time. And you've got a new article talking uh, about the kicking the can down the road at the federal level. Let's discuss that. Well, uh, there's a there's a new report that came out last week, uh, in the middle of last week, by the Social Security and Medicare trustees uh, at the federal level. The report um, uh, was was is not a good one. I mean, the report says that we are now eating into the principle uh, of the Social Security trust fund. That is that the current revenues. Uh, from both uh, payroll taxes that go to support Social Security, as well as interest earned off the Social Security principle, that those two sources of revenues aren't sufficient to cover uh, Social Security payments that are being made. Uh, and as a result, uh, we're starting to, in order to cover Social Security, we're starting to eat into the savings, into the into the principle uh, of the Social Security trust fund to meet savings. You project that out. And you and you can project that you run through the entire trust fund. You you use up all the principal uh, by 2030 by 2034, which you know because it has a three in front of it seems a long way away, but it's really only 15 years right. uh, away. So we're talking about running run, running through Social Security in 2034, and if you um, and and the law provides that once you run through the principal, that all you can uh, uh, pay is what's coming in in current revenues and and that would be about a 20 uh some odd percent cut uh in social security payments uh once we get to that point 2034 so that that's a problem it's a serious problem with with social security and the same problem exists uh with medicare that we that we've started into uh the medicare uh trust fund and are starting to eat, eat away at that and if i recall correctly uh, Medicare uh, will uh, run out a few years before Social Security. 2027 uh, is the number that sticks in mind. I may be off by a couple of years on that. But so, so these two, <coughs> excuse me, these two major um, uh, uh, pieces of the federal government and, and pieces of fed, uh, federal spending uh, are beginning to run into problems and. And to avoid that, we need to we need to uh, make changes. The longer we wait to make those changes, the bigger the changes are going to have to be because the lower the trust fund amount that will be remaining at that point, and the and the and the bigger the makeup uh, that we'll have to have to take at that point. These are going to be big issues. I, I was for somebody who follows this stuff, even I was amazed a few weeks ago when I was digging into the federal budget and realized that that two thirds of the federal budget uh, is made up of of the entire federal budget. Two thirds is made up by of what's called mandatory spending, which is principally Social Security, uh, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, and the two biggest components of that are Social Security, and Medicaid, and Medicare. So we're talking about uh, uh, having fiscal issues in uh, in in programs that make up a huge part of the federal budget, uh, and the fix on those. Uh, is 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 going to be a fix that that we need to get, or else e need to achieve, or else uh, the federal budget program problems that we that we already have currently are going to seem small compared to what we'll be hitting uh, in the late 2020s. Right. I mean, there's a. It's interesting because on the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget website, there is a calculator that says, you know, how old will you be when Social Security funds run out, and what's What's ironic is that I will be, I will not receive Social Security. I will be 65 when it runs out, which means that will be the year that I, unless they change it again, but I mean, that would officially be the year that I could start collecting Social Security since they moved it from 62 to 65. Um, that'll be it. I'm out. I mean, I'm done. There is no Social Security for me because they're not going to change their ways. And that. Uh, when you think about it, not that I was really counting on it at that point, but that puts it in stark black and white to say, I will be one of the first generations that will not be able to receive the Social Security that I have paid into for how many years? Yeah. 
Well, and it's not like they're going to let you not pay into it now. Because, exactly. Because it may not be, <laughs> you may not be there. Actually, actually, what will happen when we hit that point is that it won't, you won't get, you won't get nothing, Michael. Uh, it won't go to zero, but the, but the benefits will be cut down substantially in order to match whatever current revenues are coming into right. uh, coming into the system from 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 payroll taxes at the time so it'll be a, it'll be a substantial reduction about a quarter uh, from right. what it'll be about a, a 20, sorry? it'll be about a 25% close to 25% reduction in whatever right. benefit it would have been um which again is an almost 30% reduction over my over a lifetime benefit i mean that i paid in for uh you know not that i was ever expecting it to come back but you know, it's just one of those things. And like you said, it's not like they'd say, oh, well, it's not going to be there fully. You can, it's not like I can discount my contribution by 25%, even though my payback is going to be 25% less. That's just not how they work it. Yeah. And this is, this is, this is symptomatic of, of a, of a, of a big issue that we're, that, that we're going to be hitting over the next uh, decade or so. And that is the re- the reduction in the workforce. What's going on in America right now is is the baby boom generation is moving into retirement and 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 larger and larger segments of the baby baby boom gener- generation are going off of off of the workforce and the and the millennials and the gen xers um uh, I guess it's in reverse order the gen xers are older than the millennials that are coming into the workforce are are a lot lower number so you've got a situation in which you've got this big chunk of population coming off the workforce going into retirement, a much smaller chunk of the population coming into the workforce. And and if you look at 2035, for example, you've got every every retiree that's getting Social Security, there's only two workers uh, right. that are supporting uh, that retiree. That's the projection by 2035. So. Right. You've got a situation in which in which the workforce is growing smaller. It's a big issue for Social Security, a big issue for Medicare, uh, both of which depend on the size of the workforce for the stability uh, of their funding. But it's the same thing for everything else. I mean, income taxes, uh, 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 growth in the economy, growth in the labor force, the labor force sector is as as generating growth in the economy. It's just a big issue. Uh, generally, that that we're going to be facing in the next ten years, we're sort of seeing the tip of the iceberg show up with these reports on Social Security and Medicare, and it's and it's time to time to start paying attention to it because of those. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's going right. to be a bigger and bigger and bigger uh, economic issue and fiscal policy issue arising because of that. Frankly, and this is this is not you know I don't intend to take our discussion here or frankly, in any day in this direction. But this is one of the consequences of being restrictive on on immigration policy. Um, if you look back at American history, traditionally, uh, these sorts of issues have been offset by significant immigration. If we, As we tighten immigration policy, and there's a lot of reasons to do that, but as we tighten immigration policy, we're reducing the workforce, and and we're going to have these sorts of consequences: Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, government fiscal policy, and income taxes, government fiscal policy in general, and growth, economic growth in general, because a significant part of economic growth is growing the growing the workforce. Right. So it's a it's a it's 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 the beginning of issues uh, that we're going to be talking about generally in the economy. Uh, but certainly we're going to be talking about as part of fiscal policy as well. Well, and it was amazing how fast the worm turned because, again, it wasn't uh, but about a dozen years ago, maybe 15, that the ratio to beneficiary to worker was about 13 or 14 to 1. I mean, it was 13 or 14 people contributing to one worker. And it has slowly, as you said, because the workforce is starting to deplete so rapidly as these baby boomers uh, uh, drop out and retire – that that I mean, it is accelerating. It was, you know, you talk about fifteen to one, and now in just another ten years, it'll be two, three, or two to one. That's I mean, that's an astonishing amount. Now, this all would have been fine if Congress had simply left the Social Security money alone that had been contributed and allow it to percolate and you know invest and you know do all the things that could have. 
but they 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 rob the piggy bank, right? I mean, this is a this is an issue of that big fat bank account in the sky that they just couldn't leave lay there, and they decided to put an IOU slip in there, and unfortunately, they don't have any money to pay those IOUs back. Well. Yeah, it's uh, that the whole financing of Social Security is, is probably a separate sub issue that we'll get to at some point. I, essentially, what the federal government do, has done is borrowed the, tr- the the trust fund and put in place bonds, and they pay interest on those bonds. But federal but federal bonds don't pay a whole lot, so right, right. basically they're just holding the sort of holding the trust fund uh, 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 harmless against inflation. Not much else. They're, they haven't let it. I mean, the PERS and TERS, at least, we invest in the market, right? And, right. and we grow PERS and TERS at a fairly healthy rate. We've never done that with Social Security. So, you know, it's sort of been held hostage to, to federal government policy. It, 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 there, there's a lot of changes that, that we need to discuss with Social Security as we do this. I mean, one of them is the, is the, is the size of the benefits and the, and, the, and, the, and the expansion of the benefits. Warren Buffett gets paid Social Security, so does the, so does the poorest uh, retired American. Uh, is, that, is that the right way uh, to go? So we've got, we got a lot of issues we've got to confront as we go through this, as we go through this process. But we are going to go through this process. It, we are going to have to confront um, uh, the fact that the declining workforce, the increasing costs of, of, of medical coverage uh, is going to, to cause this problem in Social Security and in Medicare. Big parts of the federal budget, we're going to have to, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, what potential solutions are and how to come to those solutions. Well, and run that out for me here in the final seconds here, Brad, as a kind of a final wrap up here. Run that out for me in your mind as to the effect of this on Alaska. I mean, in the long run, let's, let's bring it back home. Uh, I mean, obviously, it'll affect each and every Alaskan as an American citizen. But, you know, how, how do you see this playing out in the long run for Alaska it, it is in the big picture macro view? Well, I, Alaska has a lot of retirees and, and the number of our retirees, frankly, as a percent of our population is growing. There was an article in the ADN. I think it was in the ADN this past week about about the, the, the our millennial, our percentage of millennials declining. Uh, as a percent of our total population and retirees, although I don't think it was mentioned in that article, you can find other analyses that show our percentage of retirees are growing. So, you know, not every retiree is dependent on Social Security, uh, but it is money that goes to retirees uh, and somehow, you know, ends up being being used uh, in the economy. If you take that money out of retirees' hands, uh, and Alaska has an increasing uh, uh, share of the population that that's retirees, you're decreasing the amount of money that's available for the Alaska economy. We've seen the impact of, of you know, decreases of money. We we see it with the cuts in the PFD um, and and other things. And so it's it's concerning. I mean, as a state that has a growing retiree as a percent of the po- total population, a growing retiree population, a declining millennial population. Uh, workforce population, uh, you've got to you got to be a little bit concerned about what that means in terms of the amount of money that's going to be uh, existing in the in the Alaska economy in the future. Well, and I and I think again, not just in the private economy, but all those federal dollars that we're dependent on as a state or seem to be dependent on it as a state, they'll be harder and harder to find because they'll be hard pressed to break break off that extra money when they're simply trying to pay down necessities like. Social Security, Medicare, defense budget, and debt. I mean, when those things start to get, you know, we've talked about that the other day when you look at how much the debt is going to be and the debt service is going to be in the United States, you realize there won't be a whole lot of extra largesse for all these, you know, putting sea monkeys on treadmills kind of studies and things like that. Um, and I mean, that, that merry-go-round is eventually going to have to stop. And I, I mean, I just don't want to have to be here to pick up the pieces when it does. Well, it's going to be, I mean, there's going to be a challenge because, I mean, you're exactly right, because Alaska is so dependent uh, on the federal government or so tied to the federal government, federal government dollars, um, as, as, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm spending an increasing amount of time on federal issues, because they do impact us uh, heavily. Yeah. You know, cuts in, def- cuts in defense spending, cuts in Medicaid, cuts in, 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 in other places in the federal government means either... Alaska has to pick up even more of the slack. State government has to pick up more of the slack, or we just don't have uh, those dollars circulating in Alaska. We don't have those activities in Alaska, and that's uh, that. That'll have an impact on us. Yeah. I think some of that, 
some of that impact may be okay. Some of it may not be okay. And thinking through that is, is an important thing to do. Well, we're going to be watching it all. And of course we'll have uh, the help of Brad Keithley, uh, as we go through Brad, thank you so much for, uh, thanks for coming on and joining us. We appreciate you being part of the program as always, uh, and sharing with us. We hope you enjoy, uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your week and, uh, and uh, look forward to talking with you again uh, next week here on the Big Radio Show. Michael, thanks as always for the discussion. I enjoy it, and uh, and 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 hopefully it it, it enables Alaska better to uh, to handle some of these things we see ahead. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do our best to 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 be the criers, the town criers. That's all we can be at this point. Maybe somebody will listen. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.